Good morning. Welcome to worship. We have a few announcements before we get started today. Our altar flowers this morning were given by Amy Kennel, and they are in honor of her parents' anniversary today. So thank you, Amy. After worship, a note that we do begin our youth programming today for kids two years old through 12th grade. So immediately following worship, kids of all ages are invited to head to the chapel, which is located behind the sanctuary, and they start with some music in the chapel. And then after that, they head downstairs for lunch and programming. A note that if your child is confirmation age or younger, please escort them to the chapel after worship. Uh Uh-oh. Ah, okay. So the music is being moved to the choir room, which is down the hall behind the sanctuary, and you will just follow the rest of the kids on the way out there. So please uh, escort your children to that space. A note that you may have noticed, we have some new pyramids in our space today that have been made by a group of our quilters here, and they are just extraordinary, and I think they deserve a round of applause. Thank you. They are tasked with making new pyramids for every season of the church year, and they are now working on the blue pyramids for Advent. Pyramids of this quality would cost the congregation for one season around $10,000 to purchase online. So we super appreciate the time, the work, and the artistry that is going into creating new pyramids for our congregation. Thank you so much. Our insurance task force did meet this last week, as most of you know and some of you may not remember. Our insurance premium is going up $75,000 a year because insurance companies are leaving Iowa, and after the horrific weather the last three years, insurance premiums are skyrocketing, especially for buildings that are as old as ours is. Our sanctuary uh, was built in 1886. So we have a task force that is now um, addressing this issue, and the task force is gonna be in two different parts. We have one part of the task force that is working with our broker to kind of be in good contact to see if there are any options that may come up in the future. The other task force is a fundraising and grant task force that will research some options for us to raise funds for building needs and things like that moving forward. So a thank you to those who are serving on those task forces. If you have any gifts in these areas or are interested, please email me so we can get you signed up to be on a task force. Friends, we gather for worship this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to rise for our confession and forgiveness found in your bulletins. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin and come to God for healing. Gracious God, Have mercy on us. We confess that we have honored you with our lips, but have harmed our neighbors with our tongues. The cravings at war within us cause conflicts and disputes. In our desire to be first, we make distinctions among ourselves. We place the needs of the poor and the suffering last. In your mercy, forgive us our sins. Draw near to us with grace in time of need, and turn us to follow in the way of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Friends, God promises to forgive our iniquity and to remember our sin no more. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of eternal healing, your sins are forgiven. Amen. We'll continue our service with our gathering hymn number 815, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I invite you to pray with me our prayer of the day. O oh God, our teacher and guide, you draw us to yourself and welcome us as beloved children. Help us to lay aside all envy and selfish ambition, that we may walk in your ways of wisdom and understanding as servants of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated. It is time for the children's message. If there are any kids that'd like to come up this morning. Good morning, everyone. Hola, Mapi. Venga. There's a few more kids who should be running in here, hopefully really soon. They're going to grab them really fast. So, funny thing is, is today is about waiting and being patient. 
guys are all sitting here waiting. It's not always good to be first. But good job for listening to directions. Proud of all of you for coming up. Is that hard waiting or is it easy? It's easy. Is it hard waiting or is it easy? Hard. What about down there? Isaiah, is it easy to wait or is it hard? Hard, Ali, easy or hard? Here they are, good morning. Wonderful. <laughs> there he is. Okay, how is, ooh, suckers in the morning. Make sure you brush your teeth later. Okay, so we're talking about today, has anyone ever had to wait for something? Yeah? You know what we just did for you guys? We waited for you, yes. And we were talking about some people have an easy time waiting, whilst others have a hard time waiting, right? So when you have to wait for something and you are waiting, who is the first person to get helped? Yes. Me? No, you? Yeah, okay. What about you? Your parents? Interesting. Okay, I need a couple volunteers. So Layla, can you come stand right here? Ada, can you come stand behind Layla? Gavin, can you go behind Ada? And Ali, can you go behind Gavin? Okay, so I have some people in line here. They're all waiting their turn. Who do you guys think should get helped first? The first person in line. Hmm, that's interesting, right? We usually help the first person in line, don't we? But in today's story, we are going to read about how the disciples were arguing with Jesus about who was the greatest. And do you guys know what Jesus said? Yes. All of them? Yeah. So he was talking about that he wanted everyone to put others before him. So he helped the people at the end of the line first. So, Ali, I have a little treat here. You get to pick a gift out because you waited. And you're the last in line. So, what do you guys think about that? How do you guys feel that Ali got the first gift? Yes. Kinda good, okay. How do other people feel that Layla didn't get the first thing? Ali at the end got the first thing. Sort of different, right? When you guys are standing in line at school and you're in line to get a drink, who gets the first drink? The first person in line, yes. If you guys are getting pieces of pizza, who gets the first piece? Right, exactly. So this may seem weird, right? But Jesus wants us to know that it isn't about being first or being the greatest. It's about helping everyone out. You guys think you can do that? We should all put a little effort into helping others be better than us. Okay, so don't worry, guys. As soon as we're done praying, you all will get a prize. How's that sound? Good? Okay, let's clap them and wrap them. Dear God, help us to be patient. Even when waiting is hard, we aren't always first, but help us to serve one another through God and remember to put others first. Amen. Okay. Today's reading tells of the suffering of the prophet Jeremiah, 
who announced God's word to Judah, but was met with intense opposition and persecution. Jeremiah continues to trust in God in the midst of his suffering. A reading from Jeremiah, the 11th chapter. It was the Lord who made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me their evil deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter, and I did not know it was against me that they devised schemes, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, so that his name will no longer be remembered. But you, O Lord of hosts, who judge righteously, who try the heart and the mind, let me see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. The word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 54 responsively. Save me, O God, by your name. In your might, defend my cause. Hear my prayer, God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen up against me, and the ruthless have sought my life, those who have no regard for God. Render evil to those who spy on me. In your faithfulness, destroy them. For you have rescued me from every trouble, and my eye looks down on my enemies. The wisdom God gives unites our hearts and minds. Instead of living to satisfy our own wants and desires, we manifest this wisdom in peace, gentleness, mercy, and impartiality towards others. A reading from James, the third and fourth chapters. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will be also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage with disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. In order to spend what you get on your pleasures, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter. Jesus and his disciples went on, and they passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples and saying to them that the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and on three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, and he called the twelve, and he said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all, and servant of all. 
Then he took a little child and he put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one such child in my name and whoever welcomes me and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who has sent me. The gospel of our Lord. I invite you to be seated. Friends, grace and peace to you all from Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. So I grew up in a very small town that some of you know about, a little town called Ryan in northeast Iowa. And when I grew up, we didn't have a lot of excess. In fact, I'd say we had very, very little excess. But we had a really great, loving childhood. My father was and is a dedicated truck driver. And when myself and my three siblings, who are all within five years of each other, were little, my mother stayed home with us. And so my siblings and I were somewhat limited on what extracurricular activities we could participate in, in elementary school and middle school. So we mainly stuck to the town sports teams, which were free, baseball and softball and school activities that were free until high school when all of us could get a job and then help offset certain costs and participate at a bigger level. I still remember to this day, the one semester, the three months that my sister and I got to be in a gymnastics class a town over because it was some of the best three months of my life because I loved gymnastics so much, I of course was gonna be an Olympian gymnast, if you didn't know that. I imagine it cost my parents a good sum of money at that time because some of you may have kids in gymnastics and it costs a good sum of money right now. The cost though, it wasn't sustainable. So my sister and I couldn't continue to participate in it. But when I was in first grade, I was fortunate enough to begin piano lessons with this wonderful woman named Sylvia who lived right across the street from the church I grew up in. Sylvia was a gifted piano player and organist. She played for our church and she was also just this incredibly kind older woman that we looked up to. And I imagine she gave my mom quite a deal for me to be able to take piano lessons from her. I honestly can't remember much about the piano lessons themselves, but I do remember getting to spend time with Sylvia. And I remember the opportunity that she actually let me touch an instrument, which was the first time in my life I could touch a fancy instrument like a piano. And I also thought it was pretty neat to get to do that each week, because I had never had a repetitive thing like that. But when I was in second grade, my sister Katrina, who is now in first grade, started piano lessons with Sylvia as well, which was okay. But if I'm being honest, piano was going to be my thing, right? And it only took Katrina about five months to become better than me. And I had this really unfortunate trait as a child of wanting to be the best or the greatest at anything I did. And so as soon as I found out that my sister had advanced to a book a level above me, I quit. I quit those piano lessons because there was no way that I was going to let her be better at me than something. And I knew that I couldn't practice piano any more than I already was. And I liked sports anyway, which by the way, I was much better than her in at that time. I hope she watches this. You know, to this day, one of my biggest regrets is that I quit those piano lessons. I didn't know how much music would impact my life, how much music impacts our worship life together. And I can only imagine the opportunities I might have had if I hadn't quit out of jealousy for her natural gift. I also quit out of the disappointment I had in myself that I couldn't be better. So my understanding of what it was to be great as a child was that you had to be the best, the absolute top. And I thought if I had the best at being something, that I would absolutely go for it, and I did. And sometimes in my relentless desire to become the best at something, I lost relationships. I struggled in other subjects in school or wrote them off as not important. I would prioritize my need for succeeding and being better over many things. 
and I really missed out on some opportunities for growth. In fact, to this day, I'm very proud of this, 26 years later, I still hold a middle school record in throwing discus. Because that is how early in my life I began to understand that if I am the best at something, right, if I can get my name on that board for people to see, then I have worth. Then I am a valuable part of society. And adults affirmed me only when I was successful like that. 13 years old. When I got into high school, I was about three and a half feet away from the record for discus throwing, and it just about wrecked me that I couldn't beat it. The amount of time and energy and practice I put into trying to be the best. I was offered a college scholarship to be able to go somewhere and throw discus for them, and I didn't even consider it. I turned it down because if I wasn't good enough to be the best in high school, I knew I wouldn't be the good enough best in college either, and I really wasn't willing to put my worth on the line like that. Because if I wasn't the best at it, right, I didn't want it. Of course, that's another one of my biggest regrets. I have like a whole book of them, right? If I could go back and turn back time. I'm telling you these stories that I hope you can connect with, because as you know, humanity throughout history has really failed to understand what it is to actually be great. The thing that you and I are constantly seeking, everything we honor and pursue and envy is intertwined with power or fame, appearance or giftedness or wealth or rank or title or prestige and so on, and that is such a dangerous ladder to begin climbing. In our pursuit of that kind of greatness, we can cause great and lasting harm, not only to our neighbors, but also to ourselves. If we look back to the time when the story in Mark's gospel was happening in history, we see a world that was already tainted by its pursuit of greatness. The Roman emperor at that time was Augustus. He ruled at the time of Jesus, and when he was only 35 years old, he built that enormous mausoleum in the center of Rome at 35. It's the largest circular tomb in the world. It is the symbol, right, of uncompromising power. Augustus actually wrote a piece about himself, and it was called, What I Did. Makes me think of an obituary just a little bit. This was a taking it to the extreme, though. On his deathbed, he had everything that was written in the What I Did piece engraved onto two bronze pillars outside of his tomb. And then when he died, that narrative, his personal narrative of himself, was distributed to the entire empire for everybody to read. And what it did was it complemented all of the things he had accomplished, right? The statues, the portraits, the buildings, those millions of coins with Caesar Augustus's face on them. And in his relentless pursuit, right, of that kind of greatness, because that is what was great at that time, he openly oppressed, and he tortured, and he killed thousands of people. And when I think about the church and Christianity today, and our own history, in light of this passage about greatness, I think about how we too have used our religious identity as a way of dominating others, as a way of claiming a certain status. In the world. We hold our practice of Christianity over other people. We might think that because we are Christian, we are chosen. Perhaps we are better. We are right. 
Perhaps we're more deserving. Everybody should live how we're living. At the same time, I've noticed in conversations that we can openly talk about Christian persecution that happened throughout history or that happens in the world today. But God forbid, if we talk about the pain of any other kind of persecution with the same kind of conviction. This relentless pursuit of this worldly greatness, of seeking a certain status or recognition, is really unattainable. Seeking out life in those places, right, of power and fame, appearance or giftedness, or wealth or rank or title or prestige, that will never fill the deepest needs of our souls. No matter how much we achieve, the status that we gain, the praise that we receive from others, or the approval we get from those in our lives, it will never be enough. Humanity will always want more and more and more, and there will always be something or somebody else to conquer. To be better than. So Jesus' subversive teaching today just turns our worldly ideals of greatness upside down. When his disciples are arguing about who will be the greatest, Jesus responds by physically taking a child who had absolutely zero social standing at that time. And he places it in the center of them and he embraces that child in his arms to show them that their ideas of greatness are not in line with God's. That seeking greatness in those kinds of places will never offer them the life that a life in Christ can offer them. Jesus says, whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who has sent me. And Mark's version here slightly differs from the version we would hear in Matthew's gospel. In Matthew's, it's recorded, unless you change and you become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And these harsh words barely register with Jesus' disciples. Because in just the next chapter, in chapter 10 of Mark's gospel, the disciples rebuke the people who are bringing children to Jesus to bless. And Jesus becomes indignant to the point of saying, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth that anyone who will not receive the kingdom of heaven, like a child, will never enter it. And these stories in Mark's gospel are some of the few times in the gospels that Jesus actually gets really angry. Because to welcome a little child Right? As Christ calls his followers to do today. To welcome someone who does not fit in, who's at the bottom of the social status. To welcome them is literally to extend the simplest of acts to an individual that society dismisses as insignificant. The simplest of acts. A child who has no power or fame or giftedness or wealth or rank or title or prestige or accomplishment. And yet, what does Christ say? Christ says that his followers are called to love and protect those whom society deems as insignificant. And even more, that those whom society deems as insignificant should expect followers of Jesus to love and protect them. Mystic Julian of Norwich said that the greatest way that we could honor God is to live gladly because of the knowledge of God's love. To live gladly because of the knowledge of God's love. And she compares that to like little children with loving parents. Because in Christ, there is infinite love. 
infinite grace, infinite presence, far beyond anything that this world could offer us. When we seek to live in Christ, we find a joy that is not dependent on our earthly circumstances or our own achievements or our status or the recognition we get from others. But we find a joy and a belonging that is greater than anything we could ever earn in this lifetime or that this world could ever offer us. Because we find our truest identity and our truest self in the person of Christ our Lord. And there is nothing in this world, there's nothing we could achieve that could compare to the gift of knowing who and whose you are. Beloved children of God. Amen. Our hymn of the day is number 781, Children of the Heavenly Father, and I invite you to rise as you are able. I invite you to turn to your bulletins and together with the whole church across this world, let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray with confidence for the church, God's good creation, and all who are in need. Loving God, you welcome all at your table of grace. Instill in your church a spirit of humility and curiosity that we embrace all who seek you. We pray especially for ministries of hospitality and faith formation this day as we kick off our year of programming. Hear us, O God. Creating God, you shape the world so there is more than enough for all. Curb our habits of overuse 
and guide us toward more sustainable sources of energy, food, and water. Hear us, O oh God. Gracious God, your peace brings justice and solidarity. Encourage peace among peoples, tribes, and nations. Heal divisions in our country and local communities that together we may cooperate for the good of all. Hear us, O oh God. Faithful God, you draw near to all who are in need. Bring healing and wholeness to all who suffer. Today we especially pray for Ed, James, Latjor, Vivian, Ingrid, Maggie, Russell, Malcolm, Vicki, Oscar, Lewis, Craig, Tessa, Jerry, Linda, Marilyn, Tim, Robert, Cheryl, Bert, Randy, Dixie, Liam, Cielo, and Trudy. Hear us, O God. Transforming God, you accompany all through changes and transitions. Help us to see where you are calling this community to new ways of living the gospel promise. Assure us that even as change can bring loss, it also brings hope and new life. Hear us, O God. Merciful God, you embrace us on our final pilgrimage from this life. Accompany all who have died, console those who mourn, and at the last, show us the way to eternal life in you. Hear us, O God. We entrust these and all of our prayers to you, holy God, in the name of your beloved child, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to share a sign of God's peace with one another. God's peace be with you who are worshiping with us online this morning. We are glad you are here today.
blessed are you, O God, source of every gift of your creation. By these gifts and with our lives, help us to serve one another and all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love, you sent Jesus to us, who reached out to heal the sick and the suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then again, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered together around the table by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. A kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. It is Jesus who welcomes you to this table. Come, here is your God. I invite the congregation to be seated. We do communion continuously this week. The ushers will guide you forward. In our trays, in the outer circles, the red liquid is wine. In the center circles, the clear liquid is grape juice. And we do have a gluten-free wafer available. Just ask your server. This is Christ's table, and all are welcome. Come to the table believing.
cleanse the body and the blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Holy God, you have welcomed us to this meal. You have fed us dignity at your table. Send us now to welcome others and to be at peace with one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to rise to receive the blessing. A reminder that following worship, kids and parents are invited to head to the chapel for music. Choir room. In about six weeks, I'll get it right, as long as you don't switch it on me. Friends, God Almighty, God most merciful, bless you, keep you, and give you peace. Amen. Our sending hymn this morning is 843, Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness. peace and follow Jesus. Thanks be to God. Follow Jesus. Yeah. Oh, watch out. What hand is it?